sisters, the God whom we worship, the God of the universe, does not say to us, get your act together before you approach my throne. He does not demand that we clean ourselves up to be presentable. He says, come before me as you are and where you are. Let us come before God and confess our sins. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have accepted our Lord's sacrifice for our salvation. By your power, you have raised him from the dead. You have clothed him again with flesh so that his disciples might recognize him. We humbly confess that while we know the story and believe it, it often has made too little difference in our lives. And at times we have been silent when we should have spoken of it. Forgive us, we pray, of those sins. Enable us today to reflect more deeply on the sacred story that our obedience may be increased, that our service may be more joyful, and our testimony may be more courageous. Hear us in the name of our risen Savior. Amen. Our Lord says to us, though your sins are like scarlet, I will wash you and you will be whiter than snow. Sisters and brothers, by the grace of God and through the life, death, and resurrection of his son, Jesus the Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. <laughs>
They are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. second reading is from the Gospel of John, chapter 20, verses 19 through 29. John's account of Jesus showing himself as the risen Lord to his disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands, and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I would not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out with your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you find it a bit curious that the body of the risen Christ retains the scars from the nail wounds in his hands and the wound from the spear that pierced his side? We might expect that the resurrection would have cleared up all these cosmetic blemishes. And we might hope that our own resurrection bodies will be free from our current scars. But John makes certain to mention that the scars and the wounds are still evident on the body of the resurrected Jesus. And I believe there's a specific reason that Jesus showed these wounds to his disciples. Those wounds reveal Jesus to be the eternal sacrifice as described in Revelation chapter 5. There John writes, Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. And the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language 
and people and nation. The resurrection of Christ gives those wounds new meaning. On Good Friday, the wounds were a sign of defeat, bearing witness to the power of Rome to subdue any who threatened her dominion. But on the day of resurrection, Easter Sunday, those same wounds became symbols of victory. And Jesus showed them to his disciples as if to say, I have taken the world's best shot and I have conquered the world. Rome controlled people through the fear of death. By rising from the grave and conquering death, Jesus rendered the Roman threat both futile and powerless. And later, when Rome tried to crush the early church by killing the followers of Jesus, their strategy failed once more. Because the believers, the martyrs, faced death bravely and willingly. Trusting in Jesus' promise, spoken to Martha, the sister of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Dear ones, we who have been baptized into Christ can also face death bravely. We do not need to be afraid of death. In fact, we are not to fear death the way the world fears death. Jesus did not promise that we would not grow old and die. He did not promise that none of us would die young or out of season. Certainly, he died young and out of season. He did promise, though, that were we dead, yet shall we live. And he did promise to raise us up on the last day. If we believe in Jesus, we do not need to be afraid of death. Listen, though, in Christ, we also conquer the circumstances of life that have once defeated us. In modern psychological jargon, we might see Jesus as a victim, one who was victimized by others. He was betrayed by a close friend, one of the 12 disciples. He was conspired against by the religious leaders of the people he came to save. He was the Messiah they were looking for. He was subjected to a travesty of justice. He was brutally beaten and he was executed. Poor, pitiful Jesus, we might think. But the risen Christ we see in today's text is not poor. He is not pitiful as he enters that upper room on Easter Sunday evening. He entered the room through doors that were closed and locked in order to show the marks of his victory to his disciples. He is majestic and triumphant. He's not a victim. He's a conqueror. We also have wounds, don't we? We too have been victims. People have done stuff to us. Circumstances have conspired against us. Some of us have won the lottery of misfortune more than we think is our fair share. And if we are not careful, we can become perpetual victims poor and pitiful, allowing people to walk all over us because someone else once did. We can become stoic, keeping a stiff upper lip. We can become angry, allowing our wounds and scars to boil over in a rage. We can become Christian scientists or positive thinkers, putting on rose-colored glasses and pretending that what is happening really isn't happening after all. And it, beca it can become very easy to think that we are in this mess all alone. And if that's where you find yourself today amid this pandemic 
allow me to remind you of a story that's found in the first book of the Bible, specifically in Genesis chapter 4. It's the story of the first two children born to Adam and Eve. Their firstborn son they named Cain, and the scripture tells us he worked the soil. The second son was named Abel. The scripture tells us he tended flocks. Both sons brought offerings from their toil to the Lord. Cain brought, to quote, some of the fruits of the soil. Abel brought, to quote, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. God looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but did not look with favor on Cain and his offering. And Cain became very angry. And in a fit of jealous rage, he killed his brother. When God asked Cain about his brother's whereabouts, he replied, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now here's the part I want you to hear and understand and believe. God said to Cain, listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Dear ones, no matter the wounds you have suffered, no matter the scars you are bearing, God knows. He says to you and to this world in which we live, listen, I know what you've been through. I know what's happening to you now. I know your past and I know your present and I know your future. I am still holding you in the palm of my hand. Your name is engraved on my hand. I have bought you with a price. My son died and rose so that you might live regardless of your circumstances, friends. Rejoice in these truths. Because in Christ, we become so much more than victims through the powers of forgiveness and faith. Our experience of the Lenten season and Holy Week has taught us that we conquer sin by being forgiven of our sins. Sin that has been forgiven no longer holds us captive unless we allow it to. Easter replaces that oppressive guilt that sin lays on us with God's peace. Jesus' first words to his disciples, peace be with you. Easter replaces that guilt with peace and new freedom in Christ. And we also conquer by forgiving others the sins they have committed against us. And sometimes, realistically, that is very difficult because the wounds can be very deep. And the scars are quite disfiguring. To forgive others, however, is to refuse to be a captive or to be a victim of the pain and the anger that is produced by the sins they have committed against us. God showed me this in a very real way this past, past week, sort of out of context, but let me tell you what happened. On Wednesday, I needed to mow my lawn, and Tuesday night, we had had windstorms, so before I could mow my lawn, I had to go around and pick up the sticks not only that fell off the trees on my property, but that fell off the trees of the property on either side of mine. It took me about 45 minutes to pick up the sticks and put them in my cart. And I'm sad to say I grumbled the whole time. Grumbled that there was a windstorm. Grumbled that my trees weren't strong enough to hold onto their branches. And grumbled because my neighbor's branches were on my property and they weren't going to pick them up. And after I had everything loaded on my cart and drove over to my little burn pile, I just gathered everything in my hands and put them on the pile. It took me less than 10 seconds. And it suddenly dawned on me. How often do we carry behind us in a cart all the bad things that have happened to us in our life? How long do we hold on to all those things, grumbling and complaining, poor me, I'm a victim, when all it took was an instant, really, to unload them. We don't unload our 
problems, our worries, our, our issues into a burn pile. But God says we can bring them to the foot of the cross and we can instantaneously re release them there. But in order to forgive other people, in order to let go of the wounds and the scars that have been caused, we must have faith in God's sovereignty. We must believe that God is able to create something good out of our suffering the same way he created Easter out of Good Friday. And we must accept the new life that God wants to bring us out of our pain. And more importantly, we must be willing to let go of the life we wish we had. Do you remember what Joseph said to his brothers who had sold him into slavery? It was not you who sent me here to Egypt, he said but God, to preserve for you a remnant on the earth. Joseph lived a horrific, in some ways, life in order to preserve Jacob and Israel, God's chosen people. I know there are many people, perhaps you're one of them, who live with regrets always wishing you could have the life that somehow was taken from you. You're wounded. You're angry. You're in search of vindication. Regret and anger cause people to miss the life of grace and peace that God offers right now. All regret turns out to be a fantasy. It's a wish that things could be as they can't be. And it's prideful. To regret, to hold on to my anger and pain, is to insist that I have the life that I want, rather than to accept the life that God has given me. Redemption, however, is a reality. It's the good that God gives us in our real lives right now. When we accept that we are forgiven and we forgive others, when we put our faith in the power of God to make all things new, people and circumstances no longer have power over us. In 1 John chapter 5, we read this about Jesus and his followers, which includes us. For everyone born of Christ overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith, dear ones, enables us to trust that God does indeed listen and that he will judge rightly in his time. And faith then gives us the freedom to live a new life in Christ. <coughs> Allow me to remind you what we heard earlier from Romans chapter 8. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? No, Paul says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that nothing in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Dear ones, Easter, and the Sunday after Easter, and every Sunday after this Sunday, remind us, we are no longer victims. Amen and amen.
together what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us come before God's throne of grace now in prayer. Would you bow your hearts with me? I lift my eyes to the mountains. Does my help come from the mountains? No. My help comes from God, who made heaven and earth and the mountains. Lord, we come before you this morning with all our scars and wounds, with all our fears and doubts, and we open our hearts to you. Lord, these are confusing times. These are hard times. These are difficult times. These are trying times. But these are times when you are still on your throne. And we acknowledge that this morning. In fact, Lord, we raise a hallelujah to you, even in the presence of our enemies, especially when our enemy is a silent, unseen virus. And we raise our hallelujahs to you, stronger than our unbelief. We raise our hallelujahs to you, O oh God, because you are the God of the angel armies and all heaven, led by your Son, has come to rescue us. Lord, there are so many of us watching and listening who have been affected by this virus know of people who have been infected. Perhaps we know of people who have died. We watch the news. We read the newspapers. The figures keep getting larger and larger. And we know in our hearts, Lord, that these are not just figures. They're not just numbers. But they are lives. So we lift them up to you, Lord. We lift up to you those with whom we are familiar. We lift up to you those whom we have no idea of their identity. And along with them, Lord, we lift up to you all those thousands and hundreds of thousands and millions of people around the world who are struggling mightily to deal with this disease. From researchers in the lab to first responders to doctors and nurses, and Lord, I, I can't even think of all the people who are out there doing that. But we are so grateful for them. We ask, Lord, that you would put a hedge of protection around them. And we ask, Lord, that you put a hedge around us, too, as, as we lurch forward. Keep us from going side to side. Show us the path that we should go, the path that you have marked out for us. Allow us to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. Lord, we do thank you. We thank you that we live in this great nation. 
We thank you that this nation in many ways is a beacon to the world. Yes, we have our faults, but in so many ways, we are a beacon to the world. We lead, we call others to come to us. We pray for our leaders, Lord, on the national level, on the state level, county, local. We pray for all of them. They're all struggling. They're putting policies into place to protect us, and some of us are kicking against the goats. Lord, we ask that as Jesus said to his disciples that evening of the resurrection day, he might say to all of us in our hearts, peace be with you. We expect your peace. We accept your peace. We thrive in your peace, oh God. We thank you for the church of Jesus Christ, which today is not muzzled. Oh, we are doing things in different ways. We are preaching in sanctuaries that are virtually empty. And yet we don't know how many people are hearing our sermons, our prayers, because they're going out across the internet. We praise you, God, for that technology and for that ability. Thank you for those who here week after week continue to worship, continue to make worship available to others. Lord, bless them and strengthen them, for we have no idea how many weeks this may go on, how many months this may go on. Father, there are so many things in our hearts and minds, so many people, so many situations, but most of all, God, you are in our heart, you are in our mind, and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, is foremost. For all these things for which we prayed, for all the things that you align for us, for your providence in our lives, for your will for us, for your plan to offer us a hope and a future, even when things don't seem very bright. We give you thanks and praise in the name of our risen Savior and Lord Jesus the Christ. And we pray using the words that he taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. friend reminded me this week that we are doing the things that we are doing these days not out of fear, not out of fear for our own lives, but out of love, love for one another and love for our neighbor. Jesus commands us to love one another, to love our neighbor, and during these days we love our neighbor by protecting them, by staying home as much as possible, because we don't know if we are sick or infected. It's a timely reminder of the ways that we can show love, which seems so strange. We continue in worship at this point, where we would normally pass offering plates, through the pews, but I want to thank you for your continued support and generosity towards the church. As I've said to you many Sundays now, our expenses continue. We continue to have bills to pay and mission commitments to meet, and so the work of the church continues, albeit in a very different way than what we are accustomed. So I want to thank you for your generosity, for your continued support, and remind you that you can continue to support the work of the church online on our website, firstprescarlisle.org. There's a Give Now button, which will take you to a secure web page hosted by the Presbyterian Foundation. Or you can mail checks directly to 
the church. The last two weeks we've received offerings for the one great hour of sharing, and I know this is an offering that's near and dear to many of your hearts. Thank you for your generosity towards the one great hour of sharing as well. We continue to receive uh, offerings for the one great hour. If you have not yet supported that and would like to, please know that you can continue to send in your checks for that. Finally, I would like to speak to you just for a moment about our brothers and sisters in Honduras. I was supposed to get on an airplane tomorrow morning at about 6 o'clock and fly to Honduras to spend a week there building houses and relationships and tending to our partnership with the Presbyterian Church in Honduras, but that has all changed. We will not be able to go to Honduras this week and maybe not even this year. We have been hit hard here in this country with this pandemic, but it has not spared the people of Honduras either. They are also suffering, and in very different circumstances than we are. They have a country with a very tenuous medical system, many fewer doctors and hospitals and clinics to serve a population in need. Many of the people of Honduras have not been able to work. They have not been able to support themselves or their families because of this pandemic. And it is a concerning situation. The Presbytery of Carlisle has agreed to work with the Presbyterian Church in Honduras in supporting food rations for many of the most desperate families. And we are sending money to the church in Honduras. If you would like to help with this project, if you would like to support the church in Honduras, the best thing that we can do now is to send money, since we are not able to travel and since we are not able to send supplies. If you would like to support our brothers and sisters in Honduras with this food aid program, can send checks to the church as well, and we will forward those to the Presbytery, which will make a gift to our brothers and sisters in Honduras. We give not out of compulsion and not out of fear. We give because God has blessed us with so much. God has given us so much in this life, and it is our joy, our privilege, to share those blessings. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have done great things for us, and holy is your name. You have conquered death and raised Jesus from the grave. Bless all that we offer you, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, that through us your grace and favor may be made known to all the world. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen.
Christ Jesus our Lord. Allow that peace to wash over you, healing your wounds, transforming you, turning you into a new creature. Live that peace. Share that peace with others you meet. May the God of grace, mercy, and peace, His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and God the Holy Spirit, bless you and be with you always.